Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi everyone, my name is John Crum from Microsoft Research, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Don Patterson. Don got his PhD from the University of Washington in 2005, and he wrote a really cool thesis on how to use GPS data and other, other data to infer uh, people's context, and then go on to use that to uh, figure out ways to help people, like people with cognitive decline or something like that. And I, I probably reference one of Don's papers in every paper that I write, because it was r really cool work. Now Don is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, in the uh, Bren School of Informatics. So take it away, Don. Thanks, John. Yeah, that's very gracious. I also happen to reference <laughs> a paper of yours, I think, and every one of mine also. Probably the radar stuff is the most, what radar or the um, smart move X. Um, so today, thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about a um, system that we call Nomadic, and at a broad brush stroke, it's intelligent context for situated computing. As John mentioned, I'm at UC Irvine, just south of Los Angeles, north of San Diego. And I'm in the informatics department, which is in a, a department that's uh, a sister department to computer science. We do um, those types of computer science that involve humans, in the, typically in the evaluation. So we're software engineering, human-computer interaction, ubiquitous computing. And we have some um, people with anthropological training in our department also who look at systems and organizational behavior. Um, so before I get started, I want to be clear that this is a collaboration of this work, of course, is a collaboration among many people, mostly among my students, graduate students listed there, as well as several undergraduate students who have worked with us at various times. And I, I want to start by reading the first paragraph of my abstract to sort of set the tone uh, for what we're going to talk about today. And that is, the multiplication of computing devices with which a person in the developed world interacts has grown rapidly. From laptops and mobile phones to automobiles and urban infrastructure, bits are being computed all around us. Each of these platforms brings with it a suite of sensors which are measuring the world of the user. Sometimes the sensors are intentional, like GPS and speedometers, but other times they emerge from the repurposing of other hardware, such as Wi-Fi and camera phone location systems. So in particular, UbiComp has this uh, ubiquitous computing field of that, or pervasive computing, or sometimes mobile computing, has this flavor of uh, a lot of the research is discoveries about what you can do with this sensor that you never realized was good for locating someone because before it was only used for Wi-Fi communications and now all of a sudden you can use it to find out where a user is. Or suddenly we have um, light sensors and we can tell which room we're in because rooms have unique light characteristics, light, like light profiles. And as we get a lot of devices, the cell phones that we carry with us and the laptops, they tend to have a lot of interaction with the external world and we can use those sensors in a lot of ways that we didn't expect. And so this is a lot of what the nomadic research is about. It's about using methods from artificial intelligence in the context of these sensor streams that are coming through our devices in order to infer information about the real world and why, so that computers can adapt to the benefit of their users. And um, nomadic is, is intentionally misspelled or it's a word that I made up and it's the combination of the word nomad and automatic and it reflects sort of a mobile uh, mobile society and the ways that computers can uh, help support mobile users. So my talk today we're gonna um, go through these items I hope uh, the introduction which we just went through. We're gonna talk about the idea of presence and give a definition for that. I want to talk specifically about a very concrete problem which um, is called the position to place problem something that um, a lot of researchers work on in some way or another. I want to convince you that this is a hard problem for a lot of um, reasons that are maybe more social than technical. I want to abstract the problem into one that um, I'm going to call sensors to semantics, make it a little bit bigger than the position to place problem, and then look at two applications when we're tr where we're trying to solve this sensor to semantic problem. One where we're in the context of instant messaging, and one in the context of geocapture. So when I talk about semantics, or I talk about presence, uh, what am I talking about? Well, you can imagine that there's this spectrum of space, of things that are referred to as context, a very overloaded word. And so on one end of the spectrum, you have some people that call context just the sensors 
just the data that we get from our devices. The GPS, latitude and longitude, the ambient sound, waveform, stuff like that. And the other end, we have this definition of context, which um, is one that I'm going to use, uh, which says, um, which I'm going to use Paul Dursch's uh, um, definition of it, who is a colleague with, of mine at UC Irvine, which says a context is something extremely relational between people. It's very embedded in whatever practice we're engaged in, whether it's a work practice or sort of a social practice together. It is all those things that are the background um, that are shared between us that we understand that make that interaction make sense, but are maybe beyond the ability of a computer to sort of automatically figure out because they're so temporal and so relational. So somewhere in, um, so some examples of sensors I've mentioned, GPS position, accelerometers, cameras or light, microphones or sound, and then thermometers. I didn't know this, but my laptop has something like 12 thermometers in it measuring the temperature of all the different graphic subsystems and fans uh, to support the fans. And then the context on the other side, like I mentioned, are things that are very relational. They change very fast. They're very situated in a thing that you're doing right now. And they're emergent. They're um, aspects of a relationship that change over the course of the conversation or the um, work that you're doing or the, uh, you know, the activity you're engaged in. And so somewhere in the middle is presence. And I'm going to characterize presence as being these semantic labels that bridge something between sensors and context. And I'll give you some characteristics of these things to sort of pin down the definition of what I'm talking about. Uh, they're inexact. So unlike a GPS position, a presence uh, description of GPS is not going to pin down to one particular location. They're ambiguous, so they could have multiple definitions, possibly, or multiple um, ways to be realized. However, they're very intuitive, but from a um, computing perspective, they've got to be learnable. Otherwise, they're not going to be very effective for us um, as a technological solution to the context problem. But they don't go all the way to context. Um, si they sit somewhere in the middle. So let's look at a very specific version of this, a position to place problem. Um, this is a problem that I, I give credit to Jeff Hightower for um, writing this paper that sort of describes it very nicely called From Position to Place. And so when I say position, I mean coordinates. It's things that are very exact, they're unambiguous, but they're not well suited to human communication. For example, if I said five miles south of Ikea number 92626 on I-5, you guys might guess that would be uh, Starbucks, just because you have a high probability of being right. In that case, it's not correct. It's the same thing as the thing below it, though, which is a latitude and longitude point. And while that's very effective for a mapping software or, you know, various applications. It does nothing if you want to communicate a specific spot in the world. That, that in fact, is the, my office. Um, and when I say my office, that gives you a tremendous amount more information than that coordinate does right there, even though you don't know where my office is. So as, I, as that infers, place is something that's more along the lines of presence or semantics, as I'm using the term. The, the meaning is inexact, it's ambiguous, but it's very intuitive in communication. So an auditorium is, is an example of a place. Cal IT2, which is a building on our campus, is an example of a place. And IKEA is an example of a place. IKEA is a great example of something that's ambiguous because, you know, which IKEA? You, you don't know. Not even sure if like, there's like an IKEA um, headquarters that I might be talking about. So if we go back to our spectrum and we put um, position and context and presence down, here's how it would become concrete. Your position would be coming from GPS. Your context might be getting a housewarming present. And that's, that's unlikely to ever be discoverable by a computer without an enormous amount of background knowledge or a very specific venue in which you're thinking about context. But things in the middle, like IKEA or shopping, are possibly things that a computer could figure out, even though they are ambiguous. And what's curious about the second word, shopping, is that if I were to ask you, where are you on the phone, and you were to answer to me, shopping, that would be a completely normal way for you to answer my question, although it has nothing to do with where are you. And so we want to be able to support that sort of an interaction, even though it, it, it's really not, you know, it's related to position, but it's not actually a position. All right. So let me argue a little bit about why this is hard. And um, first I want to um, mention some of the previous work that I've done, both in place recognition and in activity recognition, to sort of tell you how I got to this position of wanting to work with some ambiguous labels. So we did some work on inferring activities from interactions with objects. And this was uh, work where we put RFID, objects, RFID tags on a bunch of objects in the environment, looked at 
uh, instrumented people's hands so we could tell when they came near the RFIDs, and then tried to discover if we could figure out what activities they were doing by what they touched. And we were fairly successful at this if we assumed that we knew the whole world of activities, and that whole world of activities consisted of 11 activities, and there were things like making coffee or making oatmeal. Right? Uh, we also did some work that um, John mentioned, this is my thesis stuff, on Opportunity Knox, which was a system to provide cognitive assistance with transportation services. So in this case, we're looking at GPS and we're trying to talk about destinations. And again, we found that we could do a good job of inferring destinations if we put them into very strict um, descriptions that were exclusive and that matched up what we wanted to do with place. And then lastly, um, ISWC was another um, way of looking at activity recognition. And we kept running into the same problem of you can do activity recognition, you can do place recognition from sensor streams very well if you have a very discrete, organized ontology of what you're doing. And if you look at the research, people tend to pick ontologies of activities that work very well with their sensors. So you're going to do activity recognition from a microphone, you find that the activities that you're recognizing are sawing and hammering and making espresso and you do activity recognition from touching objects and it's, it's moving stuff that you're recognizing and, and, and cooking things so you can get orders. You do it from, um, you know, you do, you do place from GPS and of course you're only recognizing places outside and a lot, of, a lot of variations of that. So it's hard because in fact if you get this GPS location I might want to call that any number of places. I might want to call it work, I might want to call it Irvine in my case. But, but pretty soon it fractures depending on what I want to do. I might, might be places I want to go, might be places in Orange County. I might want to categorize the world into Republican counties or coastal states or public universities. And they all don't match exactly well. Right. There are a lot of places that we could potentially go to get these position to place mappings. Uh, the U.S. Census database is a great place to go if you want to look at the U.S. in terms of zoning, um, industrial, residential. Um, to some degree you can get addresses which help you a lot with this. Doing reverse address lookups and reverse geocoding, uh, you potentially can get from a latitude and longitude to an address on a street and go through a yellow pages to get back to some sort of business and then look into a business categorization. So there's some hope of being able to take a latitude and longitude and figure out that you're at a restaurant. There's a lot of places where that fails along the chain, but, but that's a potential way of doing it. You can look at satellite imagery. John's done a lot of stuff trying to categorize place in terms of like a wetlands or a light industrial or residential drawn from the color of satellite imagery. Um, a lot of Web 2.0 solutions, which are where we're going to proactively go out and label places before we need them, and then use that sort of wisdom of the crowds technique to understand what a place might be at a given position. And then custom databases. But what I want to argue is that all of these things aren't going to work very well, because it turns out that whatever system you use was built for some database administrator that had some job to do. They had to manage a facility, they had to um, organize their telephone numbers, they had to, um, I don't know, do a research project, whatever it was. And the user has very different needs that are kind of overlapping, but never match up very well. So that ontology is never going to match up exactly the way the user wants. And in fact, the user may not even know exactly what they have in mind. So the Web 2.0 solution, where you go out and you label all your Chinese food restaurants, is good if you anticipate in the future that you're going to want to do a query about where all the Chinese food restaurants are. But what if you don't know what your query is going to be in the future? And then it's very hard to know how to categorize that place. It has echoes of like, what folders do I use in my email? Because you're not sure what you're going to need in the future. And it's hard to recategorize. So let me generalize this problem to the sensor to semantics problem. Um, if the concrete version of the position to place problem looked like this, we're going to call the sensors to semantics problem being something that maps sensors to labels that people want to use to describe stuff. Um, and presence is one specific type of user semantic that I'm going to talk about today. Not all the way to context. And, and the way we're going to solve this problem is rather than looking at prospective data, people, that, people entering data that they anticipate they're going to query on in the future, we're going to restrict all our data collection to very situated practices that people are involved in. People are doing something. They're not, they're not interested in solving the sensor to semantics problem. They're interested in something else, but they're going to help us solve that translation problem along the way without realizing it. So the two applications I'm going to talk about are going to have this template. There's going to be some application, which is the situated part of the solution. That's going to give us some sensor to semantic mapping. We're going to use that as some component of an intelligent user interface, of course, coupled with the sensors. 
in order to get a semantics that then makes the application easier to use. And it's going to have this um, flavor that the more you use it, the better mappings you get and the better your machine learning can do on the intelligent user interface to make it better. So let's look at the first application um, where we're going to solve for presence. It's going to be an instant messenger. Let me um, argue for you that there's some need for this inst instant messenger. Some uh, work by Bonnie Nardi on how, looking at how instant messenger is used showed that about 13% of desktop IM two years ago, right, before IM was on mobile phones and laptops, largely, was spent negotiating availability. So, hey, can you talk right now? Are you available? Is this a good time? Um, after you've been interrupted, of course, so that your flow has been broken to some degree. But some presence is already available in Instant Messenger, right? You can specify available away in an office, in a meeting, not in my office. But it's obviously not working very well. And I would argue that this is because you're becoming online more and more all the time. And as a result, just saying available or not available doesn't make sense because you're available to people that are working on the deadline with you, but you're not available to you know, the soccer coach or something later in the day. And we want to use this as an opportunity to prove the pneumatic concept. And we think it's going to get worse as your cell phone sort of has IM on all the time and you just can't be interrupted for everything at all times. So filling out this template, what we're going to do is we're going to use an instant message client. We're going to use sensors to map to your status or your, to, to your presence, depending on what you use. This is the custom status line that you put on your instant messenger. We're going to use that um, to then, in the future, when the user wants to set their status, we're going to give them, uh, we're going to have a machine learning algorithm predict what that status is going to be and suggest that to the user so that in two clicks, one click to indicate they want to change and one click to accept the 100% accurate machine learning solution, they will set the status and they will be very effective and quick at doing very rich presence settings that are good for the user to help them manage their interruptions and, and social communications. All right, so we have a service that does this. It's called Nomadic IM. It works with Skype and iChat, Pigeon slash Game, ADM. Those are all instant messenger clients. It works on three platforms, Windows, Mac, and Linux, although it works with subsets of those instant messenger programs on each of them. It can interface in one way or another with MSN, Yahoo, Gchat, AIM. And what it does is it collects sensor information, it collects what you enter in as your status line, it creates a, a feature vector with a classification for that, and then sets that status line in your IM clients, your Twitter, your Facebook, etc. It just looks like this. Um, when I want to change it, I hit the change button, my computer does a sensor sweep, grabs the sensors, uh, I'm allowed to type in what I want to type in if the system doesn't get it exactly right, and then it sets it. So here's an example of, uh, so I didn't get a chance to learn on MSR, but uh, this is an example of what it predicted when I was in, uh, actually just before the talk when I was here. It, it tried to guess based on my time and my previous um, experience, my history, what is the most likely status that I wanted to set. And so these are all the things that it suggests. I'm in Seattle, that's a pretty good guess. I'm in Austria, that's not so good. I'm in a coffee shop doing all these activities and all these um, other situations. All right. So in daily practice, as you do things that are um, familiar, it works very well. And in fact, it works so well it's creepy because sometimes I'll want to change my status and my instant messenger will tell me what I should be doing. You know, it'll come up with, in my office, writing a paper and that, you know, I'm like, drat. <laughs> yes, I am doing that. <laughs> Put that down. All right. So the, what we do is we do a sensor sweep, we let you indicate your place, your activity, we give you some templated ways of structuring this, and then we store that. So here are the sensors that we're currently collecting. We're collecting the day of the week, the time, your IP address, your DNS, your Wi-Fi MAC address, your SSID, your network load, your active process, which is the window that has focus, and then all your running processes, uh, and then the number of displays also. And we'd like to extend this in order to include uh, information about ambient light and ambient sound if we find that's useful. Okay, then we use um, our database and we learn on that. So next time you hit change, you, it works faster and smarter. And I would like to just show you real quick what the uh, machine learning underlying it sort of comes up with. It, it uses decision tree technology right now. We started with the nearest neighbor approach and because of the way that so much of the data that we're collecting has a real wordy flavor to it, not a numeric flavor to it, like your access point, nearest neighbor didn't work very well because we had to make up a distance metric for words, which just didn't make sense. Uh, and taking a lesson from my thesis work, uh, I realized that the best way to approach AI is to start with the simplest solution, 
before you try more elaborate ones. So, so far, so good with decision trees, although we see some places where we need to add some voting in there uh, when we start getting to a mass collaboration situation. All right, so I'm going to switch to just the browser that will show you the, um, the decision tree that we make. Hopefully this won't mess up our display guy. All right, so when I, after I do a sensor sweep, the first thing the system wants to know is, am I at this particular DNS? Uh, if that's true, then it wants to know, is my activity going home? If I'm not going home, then it asks, what is my most recent, um, uh, what's my most recent application that's running? Depending on what it is, it asks what my MAC address is, and then if that's true, it indicates that, in this case, I'm at Diedrich's Coffee Shop, which is a coffee shop near campus. So it's, it's doing an information gain algorithm to decide what is the best question to ask at each time, and then comes up with this answer. Okay, so I'm going to leave some time for questions at the end if you want to ask some specifics about that. All right. So we've done some, we're in the middle of an elaborate user study for this right now where we measure the effectiveness of the AI in picking what the user wants to pick as well as some of the, we, we're studying some of the issues around how people feel about the privacy of this system. You're only revealing your status to your buddies but these are some of the things that we're looking at. We're also interested in seeing if people converge on place names because in the process of trying to disclose where you are, do people start to come up with canonical names for this room and how does that match what you would expect a facilities person would call this room? You know, is this the auditorium? Is it the MSR room? Does that canonical name change during the course of the day? Because sometimes it's a classroom or a lecture or something. Uh, and some of the initial investigation says that time of day really matters and that influenced our sensors. Um, activity influences place descriptions and vice versa as you would expect and so we use that as a feature in our learning. People want a fast cutoff switch if they realize that they're disclosing something that they didn't intend to be disclosing. They just want a like, kill button. Um, Although they still want to reveal it, right? They're not so worried that they don't want to reveal their presence. And then people want lo location disclosure varied by groups of recipients. And uh, although I sympathize with this, the instant messenger protocols don't support this very well right now. And I also feel like the management that would be involved with the user trying to display their self to m multiple groups of people at one time would just be overwhelming. So I don't know how it, it would take some very clever UI design in order to do that well, which we haven't really looked into yet. John. You're saying time of day matters uh, in terms of what the user wants to disclose or, or what your machine learning uh, infers? So time of day matters, uh, that means that the users felt like in some cases time of day was the most important indicator of what they might be doing or the place they might be beyond maybe even Wi-Fi MAC address because um, although they might be an undergraduate in a very regimented routine throughout the course of the day, what they want to display to their friends is not their class uh, sort of arrangement. They might want to just say on campus, off campus. And for that, time of day was more important than your Wi-Fi MAC address or anything else. So it's important both to the machine learning, but only because we saw that the users felt like that was valuable. Yeah. Okay, so let me give you a, another place where we're taking this nomadic template and trying to use it. We're using this in GeoCapture. And in, in, the, in the opening, in that paragraph that I read in, in against all um, suggestions of good presentations, the paragraph that I read in small font <laughs> on the first slide, sorry, um, mentioned that this was a solution for um, all the devices that we in the developing world have. Well, we wanted to try something really different with GeoCapture. And so what we did is this summer we took a GeoCapture device to Africa. And we tried to look at, uh, okay, if this is really social and it's going to be pervasive, then we need to look at the rest of the world. And so we went there to try and you know, see how well this sort of technique would use, be, how useful it would be in Africa. And mostly it was about just trying to understand the technological groundwork, but we did some initial user studies there also to look at geocapture. So let me just show you three pictures of a market in Zambia, sort of give you a sense for what life is like there in terms of a digital you know, or not digital environment. So this is just a market in Zambia. Zambia is in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's some reasons why we picked that, which I'll tell you in the next slide. Uh, here's another one. This is, this is in a city uh, environment. I want to draw out three, three um, call-outs on these pictures. First of all, if you look at that sign on the lower right, um, there's actually someone there that's repairing mobile phones and buying and selling them. And in fact, everywhere you went, there were cell phones 
being bought and sold everywhere. It's sort of fascinating when, you know, there are all kinds of other serious issues there, and cell phones seem to be um, available easily. Here's another picture. And two billboards I want to draw is one is talking about you know, how to deal with AIDS orphans in the town, and then on the left is the cell phone company uh, right next to it. So it's sort of you know, stark contrast of what's going on there. And the last one I want to draw out is just on the horizon there are a bunch of towers. This is a, um, this is a relay tower, I believe, that's connecting two cities, and this is a, just a cell phone tower. Uh, one of the things that we went into Zambia thinking is that we were going to have to support some disconnected networking. And one of the things we came away from realizing is that, no, there's basically cell phones everywhere we went in sub-Saharan, rural Zambia. So that was sort of shocking to us, but it was a good data point. Another good data point is that connectivity back to the U.S. is awful. 70% of our packets were dropped when we were in an internet cafe going back to L.A. And so as a result, the main way that people are communicating with cell phones is typically... Um, SMS because the phone, the conversations, voice are very expensive. Anything else breaks too often for you to get a consistent message through. So SMS seems to be the um, technology of choice. And and then why did we go to Zambia? Well, Zambia has lots of needs. Uh, 19 to 27 percent of the children are orphans, which is 10 percent of the population, primarily due to AIDS and HIV. And we're you know, not only interested in using this technology effectively, but we would like to use it in an application where we're uniquely situated to help. So we stayed at one of the um, orphan care villages there, and these are some of the kids we stayed with. So to, so to put it back into the framework of a nomadic application, so this time instead of IM, we're going to use geocapture. A cell phone, taking a picture, getting tagged with sensor information. We're going to tag that photo with words, and then we're going to upload it to a database for various regions, which I'll describe. But the way we're going to use this database is, much like Instant Messenger, we're going to give users a bunch of suggestions of tags that you might want to use based on the sensor stream coming in from your phone. It might be things related to your place. It might be related to what you're doing. It might be related to you know, other people with devices around you, although that's, you know, we don't support that yet, but that's an obvious way that you could take it. All right. So um, as I mentioned, we went to Africa to study if this was feasible in a drastically different environment with a different application in it came away looking remarkably good. Um, so in terms of geocapture, this is, this is just what I said. You take a photo, you do a sensor sweep, just like on your laptop with IM. You tag the photo with the GPS coordinates and the sensor stream, and also the suggested tag. And then you upload it both for the sensors to semantic mapping, but also for some other application, the whole situated aspect of it. And just like IM, the intelligent UI makes the tagging faster, especially important on the cell phone, and has the same benefits as IM. And what we found is that we took this very generic application there to see how it would be used. And we found that there were three places where it turns out it was really useful. It's useful in mapping, it would be useful for a snake finder, and it would be useful for financial accountability. And the whole model works really well with the MMS uh, or SMS model of like short bursts of information. Um, so the mapping applications, it turns out that there's, here, here's an example of us mapping one of the farms with some of the um, people who are running the orphan care farms. And it turns out that they had no idea where the boundaries were. They have kind of traditional old stones that could be moved left or right. And they just needed some like ground knowledge of how big was their farm. And they didn't know. And they didn't know where it was even. So we went around with them and they help, we helped them map it. So this turned out to be one of the applications that would be very useful. Well, along the way, you know, if you tag something with the northwest corner of a boundary or you tag it with your name or something, you're collecting information about how this space is used, right? And uh, that's useful the next time you want to take a picture there if that's a suggested tag. You know, this is my farm, this is Nisi farm, this is something like that. The next thing was a very um, user-driven concern. This is a cobra that we um, ran into while we were there, eight feet long. Uh, the people, people there are terrified of snakes to the degree that if they were as worried about AIDS and meningitis as they were about snakes, there'd be much less problem with AIDS and meningitis. But they do a lot of stuff regarding snakes. They burn entire fields down because they're afraid of the snakes living in the grass there. So something that was clear, something that could have been used with this geocapture application is something that when you see a snake, you take a picture of it and you get kind of like a cell phone signal strength bar as you're walking around that indicates like how snake ridden is this area as you walk around. It sounds funny, but there's so much, sounds funny to us, but there's so much mind share spent on this problem 
that it would be a useful way to backdoor all this information about semantics on what's going on. And then the last thing is something that's probably more relevant to um, us here, and that's donor accountability. Um, we found that there was a lot of hesitation for people in the West to get involved in development projects in Africa because of a fear that the money was going to be squandered. So we, what we did, actually, the, f the first thing we did the prototype um, user study of is we said, okay, if you are a donor in the West and you're going to contribute some money for a chicken, for a family there, how do you know that that money went to the chicken? Well, we're going to give the organization this geocapture tool and they're going to go take a picture of the chicken. And it's going to be tagged with the time and a picture and a location and maybe we'll you know, put the, don the organization there. And we're going to email that back to the donor. And so the donor can build up some level of trust that although they've gone through four or five layers of bureaucracy, the money actually got to what they wanted to, it to get to. And that could potentially solve some of these problems. It was very appealing to a lot of the organizations that we talked to there. But along the way, you're getting, pick, you're getting some semantic labels of where are the farms and where are the chickens and you know, where is the money being spent. There's a lot of information you're picking up along the way. So that, that, that concludes the... Uh, that concludes the outline of my talk. I want to leave some time for questions, but I do have, um, I am part of the Mario Brothers generation, grew, growing up in Nintendo, and so there is a hidden slide. And the hidden slide, uh, I just want to give you a sense that there's something going on here that might be much more powerful than the applications that I've suggested to you. And that's the fact that these mappings are very rich, and they give you a very rich description of what's going on in the world. What it, are all the names that people use to describe the place near here? Where are all the places that people have labeled with library before? And this is sort of like this grassroots um, generated not because you thought you were going to someday do a query for libraries, but because people were actu actually librarying there at one point. And it's going to be queryable you know, to, at, at some level. Same thing with activity. Where are the places that people read? Maybe you want to find a good spot in a park for reading, well, that's not going to show up on any, um, you know, database, uh, you know. There could be a database for good spots for reading, but someone's going to have to go, you know, start the database for reading, whereas this is going to be a very organic, people-driven um, scenario. And just to end the talk, let me show you that some of the data that we've collected um, regarding this position-to-place mapping. So we don't have a lot of users because we just released the software at... Um, UbiComp last week, and it's developing rapidly. But this is a visualization of what people are putting into our database. The tan spots are users, and the blue spots are MAC addresses. The users are labeled with their place description, and the MAC address is labeled with the SSID. So what's curious is that you could, um, you know, if you knew the mappings of where the Wi-Fi access points were to latitude and longitude, something that you know, Microsoft has been interested in to some degree, you could find where the Googleplex was. Even though no one, no database says Googleplex, or, or maybe they do, I don't know. But you could find places where, where are the apartments. Um, you know, uh, when I hook up to this Wi-Fi access point, maybe all my, su my first suggestions are going to be s in Seattle automatically because someone else has already been there and suggested that in the same application. And so this... Um, is not only an interesting way of visualizing the world, but it's also a resource for other applications to use. So if you want your profile on your phone to go to silent whenever you're in a place that uh, is 50% of the time labeled meeting, you can do that um, really easily, actually. And if you want to um, turn down your music when you're in places that people do reading or studying, you can do that really easily. Now it's not, you know, you've got to come out this with a probabilistic mentality. It's not perfect and there's some issues about string matching and semantics and stuff. But when you get enough people and labels start to converge, you get some potentially powerful kind of representations of the world. So just point out one thing and then I'll stop talking. This was uh, UbiComp. This was one particular MAC address. And you can see that you can get a very rich description of what's happening. Innsbruck was the name of the town in Austria where we were and the building was the Congress building there. And this is only with, you know, like 10 users. So, okay, so I will stop there. Thank you. And happy to answer any questions. Um, 
right now, like looking at the instant messenger application, it seems like each user has his or her own set of training data and place names, um, and so it, there, there's no sharing among other users. Right. So what what are the prospects for doing that? Um, that is that is like priority number one on our research agenda. And in fact, the visualization that I showed was the infrastructure for doing that. So right now, we only have local collection of knowledge. And, and part of the reason why we, we're not quite there yet is because we want to make sure that we're very transparent to the user about how this information is getting dis, you know, shared with other people. Um, we believe, however, that'll be very valuable. We need to figure out how to make that work with the machine lear learning approaches we've picked so far because um, you obviously want to bias your selections towards things that you personally have entered in the past as soon as you build up a personal history. So we need to come up with a solution to that. Um, the other thing, you know, regarding, um, regarding if a bunch of people put information about that particular place there and you want to use it in a mass collaborative sort of style, you probably will only use labels that people have suggested you know, more than 10 times. So if people have called this thing something consistently more than 10 times, then you'll suggest that to the user, which also helps to alleviate a lot of the privacy concerns. Because if you call it, you know, my girlfriend's house, and that's potentially a concern, it's only the girlfriend's house for you, you hope. I guess that's part of the problem. But, um, you know, you, you get the idea that you do these aggregation techniques to eliminate some of the privacy concerns. Although we don't need to know who you are. We do, we do actually keep track of specific users, but just for research reasons. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I guess I get into that that whole privacy issue. I mean, people tend to work in uh, patterns um, and or and live in patterns. And once they establish, once you pretty much figure out somebody's pattern, you can get into predicting where they're going to be. I mean, the difficult one becomes if you have to work on Saturday, right? You, you, your prediction might say, oh, he's going to the coffee house, but instead he's, he's at the office, and that would throw it off. And I guess, how, how, are you, how are you project, how are you keeping the user's stuff separate from, I mean, if I could look at those patterns of, of those 10 users, it wouldn't take too long to figure out. I could probably infer who or what they were. Yeah. So, so there, right, there's a concern that over time you build up a history of what people are labeling different places, and that gives a lot of information about identity and, and just what you do. Um, so the, the two answers to that are one, that in the context of the instant messenger application, your status is only being revealed to the, your buddies, right? So your buddies are only, the only ones that get it. So your buddies already have some sort of like knowledge about when you're online or offline. And there's always, already some sort of social you know, network there that explains why you're revealing it to them. So I think that that alleviates a lot of the concern about just broadcasting your presence generally. Now the database that we're collecting on the back end currently is, you know, for research reasons. So there ha you know, what, what are the mechanisms that if you wanted this to become a broadly utilized service you'd have to have in order to protect privacy? Well basically I think we'd throw away individual identifiers and we would aggregate data. So we would only allow data to go into the queryable database until 20, 100 people had agreed on a label for that sensor stream or something within the neighborhood of that sensor stream. Uh, and, and then there's not a very clear way of how you would reconstruct a particular sequence of labels from one particular individual. Now back in the instant messenger case, you could, right? But that's kind of something that you can actually already do. There's some, uh, there's some dashboard widgets, for example, that'll show you histories of when people are online or offline. And when, as soon as you realize that's available, it kind of creeps you out about instant messenger, actually. But, so uh, I guess the answer is to sort of take a, take a page out of Facebook and restrict that knowledge to your social network that you've approved. Or aggregate. Yeah. So when were you prompting the user for like, are you at your desk doing the, writing the paper? Or are you at your girlfriend's house? Or yeah. was it learning and getting more confident and stop, uh, stop prompting the user? Or what did you do? Yeah, there's, there's a good question about y you need these sensors to be uh, informative about the status. And so when you take that sensor sweep, it has to correlate well with the status that the person wants to set. 
And so there's both the question of when do you prompt them and then when do you, what actual moment in time do you take the sensor stream to um, put that in the database. Um, so the, the answer just very practically, when do we prompt you? We don't prompt you now. We just let you set it whenever you want to. That turns out not, not to be entirely adequate. It looks like one of the best answers to that is when your network connection changes is a really important time to prompt you to change your setting. Because you've already had some disconnection in your network, it's a real great time to bother you. Um, and then we always get the sensors just when you hit the status change. So in fact, that frequently is right before you're doing the thing that you actually say you're doing. Um, but that's okay. As long as that has some signal in there, we, we don't mind that so much. More broadly, if we wanted to prompt people when we see that maybe something about their pattern of activity has changed, what we would want to do is we would want to look at, after you set your status setting, we, you know, the hacks are you make it go away after an hour, you make old data decay, but I think the, the right thing to do is you take um, samples along the way when your status has been set, somehow indicating in the UI that the user still thinks that's what their status is, and then you can get a distribution over all the sensor readings that you've collected while that is your status, and you can start to look at like a, a KLD divergence or something when your sampled sensor distribution diverges from what you're actually seeing, and maybe when the distance between those two distributions gets too high, then you start to like bring the UI into focus a little bit more, kind of, you know, sort of like an alpha shading uh, as it gets less confident about what you're doing and kind of brings it more into the user's periphery. That would be the research direction we're going right now for that, although we're still a little bit far away from doing that. Yeah. John. So it was funny when you said that researchers tend to pick a list of activities that, that their sensors are going to work best on. Yeah. So do you think that um, you know, from your user input you could get a canonical list of activities? Mm, can we get a canonical list of activities from our users? Uh, I think the answer is probably no to that. And the reason why is because I think that in this RFID work that I did kind of suggested to me that people are doing so many things at one time that it's not that there's a canonical activity that you're involved in, it's that there's some activity you want to communicate to people that you're engaged in. So I might be riding the bus and talking on the phone and reading a book and checking email all at the same time, but what I want the world to know is that I'm on the bus. So there are probably going to be some like very popular activities that people are engaged in, but I don't think they're going to be activities that you can say this is like one of the 500 exclusive activities that people want to use to label this stuff. Because it's really part of it all being very situated is that there's some reason why you're trying to reveal this information to the world. And that sort of chooses some set of applications that you want to, you want to go from. Um, so I, I, maybe I'm kind of on a pendulum swing where like I, I used to be like everything fits into an ontology and now I'm like tag cloud, yay. And I'm kind of over in tag cloud world right now. At the same time, from this data, we think that there might be some ability to organically build an ontology. You know, people that are on the bus are frequently, you know, also at this place. People that are at this place, there's a high correlation between this MAC address and this place. And when you're at this place, there's a high correlation that other people have labeled it at this place. But the correlation doesn't work the other way. So Starbucks is a subcategory is cafe. Cafe is a subcategory of restaurant. And we might be able to pull. I, I see that more in the place domain, maybe being able to pull out sort of a categorization of the way people are using it. In GeoCapture, I am. Uh, another really good question along those lines is how well does the information that we collect about Instant Messenger translate to other applications? Like, does the Instant Messenger data, is that going to work for the GeoCapture application? Because it is very situated and people are, display, are revealing that information for a different reason. So we're interested in how well does it translate between applications. Uh, I have a question. How do you, uh, and what do you do currently to actually evaluate something like this? I mean, what's your base baseline? I, I know a lot of it is set by users, so do you have a mode where it's completely automatic and the user just reports this is good, this is bad tag, this is bad label for a particular time? The, yeah, the approach that we're taking, how do we, how do we evaluate this? Um, the approach that we're taking right now is uh, kind of uh, a twofold. One's a subjective evaluation. Like, how, do, how does the user feel about this? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Is it effective? Is it taking your time? Then there's the um, user instrument, user interface instrumentation. How often is the user changing their status? Um, and are they changing it more or less than they did before it was in, in an instrumented instant, instant messenger? 
So like if you have our support, do you use it more, do you use it less? Um, we can measure, do, do IM in, interruptions happen more or less when you have this status setting? Do the interruptions correlate well with how frequently a user sets their status? So like people that use this, do they see less interruptions? That's an interesting thing to look at. Another interesting thing to look at is evaluating our AI techniques. Um, you know, we present this list of place names to people. How often do you accept the first thing that we suggested? And how often do you take, we order those things below it. I don't, I don't know if I made that clear, but the suggestions that are listed below that are ordered in terms of most likely next place. So you can do an, just a basic accuracy evaluation that says, are we right? Is our first choice right? How often is our, how often is the user's desired recommendation, desired place name within the top X? Um, suggestions. Um, and then we can also look at how well features, uh, how useful features are in determining what people want to call things. So Wi-Fi MAC address you expect is very highly correlated with place. What's very highly correlated with activity? Is like your place setting the most important thing for setting activity? So these are all in things that we're really interested in getting some hard data about. Um, there are some other things we're interested in that are, we're not quite prepared to measure yet, but they're things like, does the group of buddies that are online now influence how you uh, set your presence? So like if it's work time, do you choose one label for your home versus if it's nighttime, do you choose a different label for your home? Because I'm working at home now, so it's like home office, but later in the day it's, you know, gardening or something. Yeah. Do you have? A, do you allow the user to set multiple states? I mean, kind of like you currently choose yeah. the top, but sometimes you'd want to label things like at work, at MSR, or at. I mean, you might be traveling but still at work, so you might want to have an at work but somewhere else label. And that could be done by like multi, like a multi instead of s selecting just top or one off, just select many of. Yeah. See. That's a great example. That's a great example. It proves my point. Thank you. <laughs> um, the answer is no. We don't do that. Although we do, well, what's the answer? The answer is that you get three columns. So in a sense, you have three different ways you can describe what you're doing. And we suggest to you that the way you might want to use that is label the first one place and the second one activity and the third one's kind of free form. Social, don't interrupt me, something like that. Um, so to the degree that you can fit what you want to say into those three templates, we do allow multi-select. But in terms of can you specify multiple activities at one time, notwithstanding the fact that I just said that to John that we need that, you can't do that right now. Um, except, I mean, you can do, you could do little hacks. Like you could put three things separated by a colon in that field if you wanted to. I was also thinking particularly with regards to place, that might give you some of the, some of the ontology you're, you're looking for. Because oh. sometimes, you know, you can be in Seattle, in Redmond, uh, at MSR, and all of those things, and that could give you the ontology that you're looking for for the place or activity. Yeah. I have a student that's very interested in, um, in user interface design, and one of the things that we've been brainstorming with her about is that rather than selecting a drop-down list, you put a graph up there. And when you select something for your place, you're not just selecting a, a word label, you're selecting a position in a graph that maybe captures a hierarchy and maybe captures some synonyms at the same time. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's almost like context within context, you know. I'm at Microsoft at work, but not Microsoft, you know, at lunch or something. So, yeah, that, that's a good idea. I and mean, we haven't concretely realized that yet, but we have some ideas. So one of the things that's going through my head here is that you, you have an intelligent context about place. So if someone's at the bus stop, you know they're commuting. However, if they're at the bus stop at 7 p.m. and making some assumptions, you could know that when they're leaving work late, that they need, um, they always buy fast food or they pick up something. And, something. and you know, the bus stop advertisement could change to be, you know, this is what's available at Safeway, this is what's available at, uh, you know, Delmonico's, I, you know, mm -hmm. you, could, you, you could just imagine this whole contextual thing that because while I'm commuting, I'm really thinking about what am I going to have for dinner. Yes, and yeah, that's a very, that's a very good observation. Um, 
I, I think that the most um, kind of exciting commercialization prospect for this is the fact that you could, you know, with 50, 40, 50 percent accuracy, know that someone's going to be grocery shopping two hours from now and say, here's a coupon for QFC. It's Copper River Salmon, $30 a pound discount. So um, there's some potential for not just like advertising at the point of purchase, but actually advertising two hours before you're going to do it to sort of like swear over there. They give you coupons at the end. What they should be doing is giving you coupons as you arrive. Yeah, well, kind of further back when you're making your plans about what to do and what you're going to have for the week, right? You want it yeah. when you're menu planning. You want the coupons right there. So, um, well, um, Tesco is a British um, grocery chain, and they have gone totally away from the big store and they go down to the small store. But their focus is they know the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So if there are a lot of Polish immigrants in that neighborhood, they have a lot of um, sausage meats and prepared meats in that store, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of stuff around that. And they are highly successful, because what they've done is categorized England by very small, um, focused areas that those stores serve. Um, they've now come to the US, and they've started in the southern US, and our Southwest, and I can think they are doing some very interesting stuff, and I think the same stuff is happening with our elections, um, because now they, you no longer focus on states. We see all the information by blue state, red state, but yeah, counties they, they do it by the, the voting districts. There are only certain voting districts you have to win, Yeah, and you, you win the state. Yep. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah.